So let's start with uh, the definition of the yield function isotropic and kinematic hardening for a uniaxial stress state. Let's consider a uniaxial stress state here. For simplicity, I will consider a bilinear stress state. Uh, in which case I will take an example as the linear path to follow in this way and then after a certain point or some amount of stress which the structure has undergone it will consider another path or it will follow another path. So this is the stress and this is the strain. This is the linear or the elastic region which is given with the elasticity modulus E and here you have the bilinear the second part or second linear part which can be described with the tangent stiffness ET. Now let's say that at a certain level of strain given as sigma uh, epsilon y we get a certain stress level which can be given as sigma y and in general formulation we know that sigma y is used as a yield stress so sigma y can be written as a yield stress at a certain strain epsilon y. Now the condition wherein sigma is equal to sigma y yielding occurs. Therefore we can define a term called the yield function and it is generally written as f to be equal to 0 when yielding takes place. Hence we can define f to be equal to sigma the magnitude minus sigma y where sigma y is always considered to be positive. So this is the this is simply the definition of the yield function for a very simple case. Of course, we look at a little bit more complicated cases just uh, within a few minutes, but this would be the basic definition. Now, for any strain beyond sigma y, so if we go beyond over here in this direction, any of these strains beyond the sigma uh, epsilon y, I'm sorry, the strain increment can be regarded to be composed of two different contributions. The first one would be the plastic contribution and the second one would be the elastic contribution. So the strain just does not correspond to the plastic contribution after this point spe specifically for hardening purposes. There's also an elastic behavior which is still retained within the uh, material. So we can say that the d epsilon beyond uh, the epsilon y we write here when epsilon is greater than epsilon y this would be composed of d epsilon elastic plus d epsilon plastic there's of course a condition that the elastic uh, strain will exist only when the tangent stiffness e t is existing that means the curve should not become flat there should still be this slope so the d epsilon is not equal to 0 only when the et is not equal to 0. Now this, uh, this change in strain is of course associated with an increment of the stress d sigma which can be described in many different ways. Now the so basically when I said the change in strain I meant the change in elastic strain so we can write with for d sigma to be equal to the change in uh, the so basically the modulus times the change in the elastic strain so we can also write this as by replacing by inputting the equation 1 over here we can write this to be equal to d epsilon minus d epsilon p which is the plastic strain and of course in another case you have d sigma which can also be written as the tangent stiffness times the uh, change in uh, strain beyond the um, epsilon y. So by replacing uh, the terms over here inside uh, in the previous equation and then equating it here we can also write that there comes in a certain term called hp 
which is relating this d sigma to the d epsilon plastic and this term hp is called the strain hardening parameter and depending on what the definition of the strain hardening parameter is it can be different kind of a hardening law sometimes it's also referred to as a plasticity or plastic modulus uh, if you substitute the rest of the values in which i will not do in details here but it's quite simple to work out you will find that the strain hardening parameter can be written as the tangent modulus by 1 minus the tangent modulus by e or you can also write the tangent modulus to be equal to 1 minus e by e plus the strain hardening parameter multiplied entirely by e if you write this standard expression then you can see that if the hp is equal to 0 then of course the tangent modulus also becomes uh, it is because the tangent modulus is equal to 0 that means that the material is called an elastic perfectly plastic material so if the material has not yielded or is unloading then the tangent stiffness is equal to the initial stiffness which is the elastic stiffness and hp doesn't have to be used in the calculations at all right so let's look at the conditions of uh, hardening then in that case let's go back to the graph that we made before over here first of all let us just recap what we already studied so we see here that up to the point of epsilon y you have the uh, yielding stress sigma y and beyond this point you will always have a certain contribution of your plastic and your elastic strain so if we just consider any two points on this curve over here and this consider this to be the change in strain then these would be consisting of two parts of strain which would be given as the plastic strain and the elastic strain and of course corresponding to this change in stress you will get your change in uh, sorry change in strain you will get your change in stress as well just as shown over here now if we consider that this point over here is given as sigma is a point b then the stress at this point is given as sigma b so the total uh, elastic strain that you want to consider over here at this point would be if i take the same slope as my elastic part so i use the same one from here to here then i will get a elastic strain in this region between these two points over here this would be d epsilon e and that can be then described also as sigma b by the elastic modulus e okay so basically as a recap you have your elastic uh, you have your complete strain which is composed of an elastic contribution as well as a plastic contribution and when the material is unloaded and if it is not perfectly plastic that means there is some elastic component still in it so the tangent stiffness is not equal to zero then in unloading you can follow the same path as with the elastic modulus and you can define your elastic strain contribution out of that hypothetically now let's look at look come back to the strain hardening parameter we already described that the strain hardening is going to define the plastic modulus so if the uh, if the part is per elastic elastic plastic or perfectly uh, plastic then the strain hardening doesn't come into picture however in this case we do have some strain hardening as we've seen in the uh, figure before so to make things clear about how we define it let's load uh, the structure first elastically and then combination of elasticity and plasticity and upon unloading it can follow certain kinds of behavior which will define the kind of uh, isotropic or kinematic hardening that the structure is undergoing so of course this is the uh, initial elastic condition this is the tangent modulus 
and then under unloading you can use the same elastic stiffness again now in unloading it doesn't just stop here but it can go beyond this and at some point you will be able to define the same tangent stiffness tangent modulus over here to trace its path backwards so in case this of course is given as sigma b as we have seen before so at the point b if this sigma b is the same distance path that it follows in the reverse or unloading direction then this is called isotropic hardening however this uh, of course ignores the Bauschinger behavior and uh, this isn't actually what happens most of the time what, what happens most of the time is that you have a sigma y and because of some losses in the elasticity and more plastic, plastic conditions the path only traces up to a certain distance which corresponds to the sigma y instead of the uh, sigma b. That means this total distance over here is given as 2 times sigma y and that refers to kinematic hardening behavior. So in first case for isotropic hardening you have your plasticity range which is defined by 2 times the sigma b. Yeah, the elastic range expands but in the kinematic hardening the elastic range stays at the 2 times sigma y value as opposed to the 2 times sigma p value. So the yield function therefore for this case can be written in two different ways. For isotropic hardening you can write the yield function f to be equal to the sigma minus sigma naught where sigma naught is of course given as sigma y plus alpha which I will write towards the end and for kinematic conditions you can write your yield function as sigma minus alpha minus the yield stress and here sigma naught is given as sigma y plus alpha which is defining the maximum uniaxial stress which is reached in the previous plastic straining and alpha is a kinematic shift this is a kinematic shift and we will see this uh, how this kicks in this kinematic shift how it comes into picture but if you look at the relations back again up here we, we can see that prior to yielding when yielding hasn't occurred then this kinematic shift factor alpha is equal to zero and that makes the sigma not to be equal to same as sigma y so elastic conditions are predicted when sigma and alpha are defined in such a way that f is always less than zero and yielding will occur when f becomes equal to zero as we have seen before so if i want to write this over here for clarity i can say before yielding alpha is equal to zero sigma naught is equal to sigma y therefore f is less than zero and at yielding f is equal to zero has already been shown to you before now the condition that f is greater than zero is actually physically not possible because if you have continued or renewed plastic action with strain hardening then alpha keeps on changing that kinematic shift actually occurs because of the stress state of your uh, structure and it modifies the yield criteria uh, and what you see is that initial isotropy is going to be lost in the case of kinematic hardening whereas it is preserved in the case of in the case of isotropic hardening but when i mean loss of initial isotropy i don't mean material conditions like elastic modulus but actually the yield behavior so as you see here in isotropic hardening you went up to the plastic strain sigma b but you also went in the reverse direction to sigma b making the entire yield range to be two times sigma b which is what doesn't happen in the case of kinematic hardening precisely because of this kinematic shift factor and this kinematic shift factor is also a contribution of the deviatoric stresses which come into picture in the uh, in the way the stress is defined which we will come to uh, in the following video now 
in order to define a prop material completely it's always important to describe some parameters carefully so as to describe their physical nonlinearity or any kind of behavior so the first one is the yield criteria or the yield function of course the second one is the flow rule as to how the material behave in flow conditions and the last one is a hardening rule these three conditions describe the behavior of a material completely so commonly used so for example if i have a material which is metallic such as copper and i compare it to a material such as a carbon fiber then their description or their behavior is completely different and it would depend upon the associated rules for flow for hardening as well as the yield criteria uh, in the metals it's mostly uh, you are very well aware of the one mises yield criteria when the one mises yield criteria is combined with a flow rule then you have a really good description of the metallic uh, behavior in general